Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Katherine Garforth from the Right to Read Initiative, and I am so excited today because we have Lisa Hermant joining us from Vancouver Island, and she's going to tell us all about her reading journey. And I really love doing these conversations because it helps other people at different levels uh, if then schools to realize that they're not the only ones on this process and that, you know, everyone, there are a lot of teachers have walked these exact same steps and felt these same feelings. Uh, so even though it's uncomfortable, it's worth doing. Thank you so much for joining me today, Lisa. Why don't you take a minute and tell people who you are, your role and what you do in that role? Hey, Catherine, thanks for having me. Um, my um, role this year is a, a school-based literacy coordinator, um, and I'm, I'm super happy to be doing that again next year. So I have another year of that. Um, so I took a leave from a grade one, two classroom that I'd been in at um, an elementary school for about seven years teaching grade one, two. So just stepped out as a literacy coordinator. That's amazing. Uh, and, um, so can you tell me, like, go back to the beginning, what made you want to be a teacher? I, school was wonderful for me. Um, it was a really great place for me. It, it was easy and enjoyable for one. I love, I loved everything about it. I was the kid helping in the library, shelving books, helping in the art supply room, organizing, um, if my teacher needed help putting up a bulletin board. I was there helping the little ones tie skates um, from Northern Ontario. Mm -hmm. And um, I just really, I just enjoyed everything. And I feel like back then I, I had a feeling that I would be a teacher from when I was young. Awesome. So you finished high school. Where do you go next? I went to Lakehead University in Thunder Bay and I did a um, concurrent ed program. Um, mm -hmm. When I graduated in 95, I um, was, it was primary focused. And I um, moved out west to BC um, just soon after graduation to Vancouver Island. And um, I did not start teaching primary. I started in a middle school. Okay. So the concurrent education program is when you're, you do it. So you're doing your university courses along with the teacher education program. So in those courses, did you get a background on reading development, linguistics, or anything about teaching reading? No, I, I maybe thought I did. I didn't know <laughs> what I didn't know. Um, I know I didn't now. And at the time, um, because it was concurrent ed, it was pretty great because we got into schools pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. And um, just being in there and seeing what the teachers were up to. But um, previous service teachers don't always start at the beginning of the year. So how did that start? What did they do? What was step one? I didn't know. Yeah. And that can be hard. I, I know even in my own teacher education program, it was all what you do once they're reading. Yeah. Um, and that's great, but we also need to have, to know how to teach them to read and identify those ones that are struggling. Exactly. Um, there was beautiful picture books, um, wonderful read alouds, um, units linked with uh, literacy, linked to science and linked to social studies um, and on and on, and which is beautiful and wonderful and, and really important. But um, when I did move to, I moved to Port Alberni first and now I'm in the Couch and Valley, but a friend of mine asked me to teach her son how to read. Could I please? He was ready. He was hitting kindergarten in a month. And he was just dying to learn how to read. And I said, sure. And then I realized I didn't know step one. I didn't know what to do. And my answers made no sense. Read to him, read with him. And from there, I had no other answers. Talk about the alphabet. I figured the song was there, but that's not going to teach us how to read, singing that song. And um, truth be told, that's why I started in middle school. Yeah. That's why I started in middle school. Wow. So what grades have you taught over your career? Uh, one to nine. Um, 
at in Port Alberni. I taught math, science, and PE. Um, and um, grade nine here, I taught an alternate program at a middle school. And then um, pretty much everything in between um, one to six in elementary. So did you have to do any additional training when you were moving from the middle school grades to the earlier school grades just to give you more information on teaching reading at that level? No, um, I didn't take any extra courses. It, well, actually in Thunder Bay, I took a summer course that um, allowed me to become um, intermediate trained, they called it. So I did do that. Um, it was pretty light. It was a quick course um, to, that qualified me to teach intermediate. And I realized like when I went to teach intermediate, I wasn't fully prepared to teach all of the subjects at mm -hmm. all. My teaching didn't really prepare me for that. But what I could do was go to a body of knowledge and do my own research. I could get my hands on awesome units for, I taught acid, acids and bases, um, battery circuits with electricity, um, really fun, engaging units. I could go do that research. I could reach for Bill Nye videos, but it wasn't the same for reading. Yeah. Okay, so you're talking, you mentioned your friend's son was getting ready to read and you weren't sure how to do it. So where did you go? Like, What, what did you look for to try and help you on that journey? I um, avoided it. And then I had my kids and I moved to the couch and valley to Duncan. And when Maya, I, I took a break, I was in a new town and had another little baby. And when Maya entered kindergarten in 2005, I felt like I'd been hit by a bolt of lightning because I walked in that K-1 room and there I could see that these ladies, Carrie and Darlene, had something figured out that I hadn't. Um, they were focused on the phonemes and the graphing in a really fun way. So as a mom, I spent every minute I could in that room. Um, I also like really needed to learn a lot more about procedures and routines and systems, which I did, which is your first step to learning and things were so smooth. I had lots to learn that way from them. And then, um, but with actual reading, um, they had this similar story to me they had taught middle school. They had shared um, with an older grade and had the opportunity to teach grade one and didn't know how. They knew that their Darlene's kids had learned really solidly. So they went to their kid's grade one teacher. She had learned from a program called Blended Sound and Sight, Blended Sight Sound. And mm -hmm. it was a woman in um, Saskatchewan in the 1930s who created this program named Anna Ingham, who went on to um, be awarded the Order of Canada. And she had a one room schoolhouse with lots of kiddos that needed to read and she needed to reach them in many, many ways um, at all their different levels. So she created a system on her wall called Sound City. So as they learned a sound, it would be connected to something fun, up on the wall it went. Um, car would have the R, um, R control sound in it. And up went a car and for the rest of the year there it would be. And as the kids learned these um, phonemes and graphemes that match onto the wall. So Carrie and Darlene had um, gone and learned about this after school one day. It was really quick. They didn't take the big course. So what they thought was it was focused on the, the sounds and color words. That makes sense. So they created their own program. I'm going to show you. Um, they made the color keys, the color tools. So in color words are a lot of interesting and advanced graphemes. Um, so they, they started with that. And in primary, you really do want the kids to have those color words down. So at the beginning of the year, we do a lot with color words, but then at the same time, they were analyzing the, um, the sounds that would be found in, in these color words. And then as they learn the color words up on the wall, it would go with a really cool graphic. Does that make sense at all? <laughs> Definitely. And what I want to highlight from that is that you said that your daughter entered kindergarten in 2005 and they were doing this work. And, you know, I, I lived in Duncan for a little bit. Duncan's not a big place. Uh, I remember always like the saying was Duncan, don't blink, you'll miss it. Right. Uh, I mean, it's gotten a lot bigger now. 
but still it wasn't a big place. So it's not like a city center where all this training is around you and you can get it. It was active involvement of these teachers to go out and seek the information so they could do better. I now, think, sorry, that was 17 years ago. Yeah. And a lot of teachers still don't really understand what phonemes are. And no. to me, that's a huge problem. They because felt alone um, because they job shared. There was a synergy and they were both extremely creative and hardworking. They figured they made probably their husbands figured they made about a dollar an hour for all of the work that they did at the dining room tables on top of their school day. Um, what I want to add to that is that when they weren't teaching at Alex Aiken in grade one or K1, one, two, they always were in that range. They were job sharing a job at the alternate high school called Seabolt, and they were teaching teenagers to read. So what they were doing in the classroom, maybe it didn't look as cutesy and young and engaging the same as like maybe the kids there wouldn't be making a color crayon looking at the or sound, but they used the exact same principles, the exact same methods, the exact same approach and systems, and it worked. So there was, they knew they had something there. They also um, got small pieces. They would go and ask for pieces at the middle school because they knew that there would be kids in the middle school that didn't have those pieces that they needed in the strong foundations. So people here heard, saw that. They put on workshops. Um, a lot of people went to the workshops. A lot of people had their program in their, in their classrooms, but they did feel siloed. And, and it was those, those phonics ladies, those phonics ladies, because of course, when I went to university and at that time, um, it was full language. What is the purpose of meaning uh, of reading is for information. That's where we start with whole words and with reading out loud and, and surrounding them with whole words, label your classroom and they'll get it. Memorize these sight words, they'll get it. Mm -hmm. And um, analyzing words by by the phonemes wasn't happening. Yeah. Well, I love that color box. I haven't seen a, the box of crayons before. <laughs> it's amazing. I love how systematic and explicit it is. So for the color orange, you're looking at words that have that OR digraph. Yeah. So and they would start with a big bowl of oranges that day. Mm -hmm. the kids would have an orange and they would get to peel the orange and smell the orange. And then they would get a little... Um, activity to cut out and then what we're going to do is circle or and say or and say or and that's all we would focus on but these kids had their consonants hopefully and and their um maybe not digraphs yet but they could surprise themselves by reading or cork i read cork and then they would have lists maybe to go home and and find the or key and then up on the wall would go like an incredible graph, graphic, a visual cue with the or sound. Wow. They didn't start with or, they would have started with actually short vowels. This is, this is the eh, red ed. And from there, they would look at, um, at the vowel sounds. From them, I learned that there's 44 speech sounds. I had no idea. And over 250 ways to represent them. So what we needed to do was teach the kids the code. And when you have little kids teaching the code, you have to make it really fun and engaging. So this hooked them. So once you circle or a pile of times, and this is on your wall, they see or everywhere now. Mm -hmm. Once you talk about noisy E's, they're gonna see noisy E's everywhere and find them. So it was really an engaging way for, for the kids. There was the visual cues, there was that multi-sensory, um, activity and they kind of came up with it on their own. They went deep, um, they, like they went deep into research papers from the University of Oregon. Um, they had read some Louisa Motes, but I wasn't really on the internet looking at that time. It wasn't a lot. I didn't even know how to look for that. I just figured it was a mystery. English was crazy. Reading was um, something that they would just get. But when I saw this, they had broken it down into a way that made sense to me finally. Yeah, and you know, that's something that I hear from a lot of teachers and educators and even parents that once they kind of do that deep dive or have a better understanding of how this works, like, 
well, that was easy. And why didn't I learn it that way from the beginning? It would have made it so much easier. And that's what this whole thing about the science of reading is really about making sure that we build that foundation and give students the steps that they need to do well and be successful in reading. So after you learned about Darlene, and sorry, Carrie and Darlene, yeah, Carrie Darlene's um, program, um, when did you start adding additional tools to your your toolbox on you know teaching reading? Well, they had, um, they, they went on to teach my second daughter mm -hmm. and, um, I was next door in the classroom next door, actually, um, for a stint. So I literally would be at the wall listening to them <laughs> doing their lessons. Everybody, and, I'm trying to learn here. <laughs> <laughs> my kids go to music and there's me at the wall. I mean, I would have been welcome in, but only so much they could take of me, um, that at that point, I think it was about then that they, that Carrie had um, done some research and, and um, found Hegarty, Dr. Michael Hegarty's book, um, his phonemic awareness book. Um, I love that she had questions. So she called him on the phone. <laughs> she like about rhyme, perhaps. I think that was the one and asked him, um, I, she said, and from my research, I understand it's not a great predictor of reading, but we do it in our room. Um, but if a kiddo can't rhyme, do I spend a lot of time on that? Anyway, he, he answered her questions and um, they brought the big phonemic awareness um, Hegarty's into the district. So I, again, had no idea. And even if I did, I couldn't have come up with that on my own. I couldn't have come up with those lists and activities on my own. And I didn't know where to turn for that. So that also made me feel better about teaching reading. Um, from my grade two room, I went and taught grade four and six. So I kind of had taken a step out of um, the one, two realm. And um, I think that was when my grade nine piece was there. But everywhere I went, I was bringing this information because lo and behold, there's kids in every grade that need it. Definitely. Now, I do want to highlight that ha the Hagerty program has been very controversial in the past year or so. And Personally, I think it is a good program to use here and there. And it's a great resource for teachers who are not solid in their phonological awareness. And it serves as a resource for them to take information from. That program is well thought out. It has information there. Now, the extent that it's used doesn't need to be the same. But I think it's a great resource for teachers that are just starting out and understanding phonological and phonemic awareness because they have the material to source from and they don't have to go searching for it. Now, if you do go to the Hagerty website, they do offer um, uh, a sample of three weeks of their lessons. And even just looking at that can give you a lot of insight. Now they've, they've worked on revamping their program um, and it, it sounds promising, but it's, you have to take it with a grain of salt, knowing that not all of your students are going to need this to this extent. So once they've solidified in the basics, uh, then you, you don't need to continually do the same exercise over and over again. No, um, no. And that was, has been my learning in the past couple of years, um, I mean, even at that 15 minutes at my feet, you know, could be too long. So I would do just half the columns and I would, again, like skip some of those things like the rhyming and, and some of the other activities, but it was something wonderful to have to, to get started. And now there are so many resources to turn to. Mm -hmm. um, it's amazing now for sure. Um, another resource at that time that um, if they weren't at the Seavolk site or at Guam, there were other people working with the students and um, everywhere they turned, like all of the programs were whole language or um, just, just not based on science that they had learned. So they had found, this is from Long, from a mom who had um, a dyslexic son. She was a researcher herself. Um, I can't remember what, what type of researcher, but 
she wrote this book called Right Track Reading. And in this entire book are um, scripted lessons that if you don't have a solid knowledge base yourself, you can follow this scripted lesson and make a difference in a kiddo's life. So they had used this book um, just as a supplement. They had a lot of skills, um, but I did find like when I went in and I was teaching intermediate classes um, during literacy times or um, read to self time, this would be maybe what I would be running off the side of my desk with small groups of kids or um, I had, I would train EAs to be able to take a kid or, or two. Um, we have indigenous support workers that come in our classroom. Um, so that's something that you can spend 15 minutes talking about and training. And then um, it's, it's scripted. So it, it is multi-sensory. Um, it follows like what, what a lot of the other programs follow with the visual drills and the multi-sensory saying the sound, writing the sound, analyzing the sounds. And then it has some, um, has supported text. So it goes from um, words to phrases to sentences. And so that I found made me feel a lot more secure. I didn't have that depth of knowledge. I knew um, what I shouldn't do, but, it, but that made me feel more solid and comfortable. So that would have been another piece to my puzzle. Well, and the thing that I want to mention there is that when you get these scripted programs, that are based on evidence and the research, it allows you to learn along with your students and gives you the resources that you need to help your students while you're doing it. When we're asking teachers to shift from a balanced literacy, whole language approach to reading instruction towards more a science of reading, structured literacy base, we're really asking them to spend a lot of time doing learning while they're still working in a classroom with students and they have a life outside of school, whether you believe it or not. <laughs> um, so anything that we can do to help support this learning and make it easier for them is good. We don't want to have teachers having to create these things from scratch because as you said, you know, those teachers were getting maybe a dollar an hour <laughs> uh, given all the time that they're doing. And it's not realistic to expect teachers to do that. And you don't want them to learn this stuff through trial and error because that's not fair to anyone. No, no. And like I said, in a classroom, it's so busy and you have to figure out your, your basis of your program, your, your structures, your routines, your systems. And then, mm -hmm. and then every, if you're teaching elementary, you have all of your subjects to learn. So mm -hmm. to teach, so if you have something to reach for, um, they, they built a solid um, position of trust in our district. So, okay, if you said, say so, I, I will do it. Um, and I, I have found that really effective. Um, Perfect, maybe not, but um, it's it's portable. It's 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 you know it's an easy book to carry around. And um, what I ended up when I went back to primary was using the scripted lessons whole class, um, and the kiddos had a whiteboard. So if you were working one on one, you would use letter tiles, and um, and also a whiteboard. But then as a whole class, I you know you could manage. And then what I would do would would copy that connected text to my lesson photocopy it and um, give it to the kids for practice. Of course. Another thing I wanted to highlight was that you mentioned that there's a high Indigenous population in your school and you have those Indigenous support workers. Now, one thing, I, I don't know if it's something that you have done, but especially when it comes to things like phonological awareness, these are activities that can be done in a student's home language. And because phonological awareness and phonemic awareness is a transferable skill. So if they're able to work with that pullout time, working on these, some of these skills with the same cultural uh, content that they talk about during that time, it can be very effective. Yeah, that would be a really great next step for our school. Um, the, the language spoken here, spoken here is Halkaminam. Yeah. And the kiddos have Halkaminam lessons. And um, it would be really neat to link that breaking down the speech sounds yeah. um, with the Hulkaminian language. 
Of course, definitely. Yeah. Okay. So you said then you, after doing middle school for a little bit, then you came back to the primary grades. You're using the right track to reading lessons. Did you look further at that point? I, but yeah, I was always searching. Um, I knew solidly because of what Carrie and Darlene had taught me. Um, we want to analyze words, but not, not memorize them as a whole. I knew that sight words were decodable mostly. I knew that I didn't know actually this. I just learned about 4% are truly irregular. This is something I've learned recently, but um, I did know some were truly regular. So what they had was an alien word wall. So it would, those words would be shot out to space once we had analyzed and arm spelled um, what us was, um, how, what's the what, and we would, we would write it down. What do you think the uh is? What is the zzz? Um, and the kids would practice writing on their whiteboards, break down the what do you think it is? It's not what we think it is. So we would analyze and, um, and learn to properly spell, say a word like was, and, um, and then shoot it off to space. Um, so I did know that. And um, I knew also because of their research about no three cueing, no looking at pictures, no guessing. In fact, cold reads were gonna be really tricky for the kids, maybe really a little bit um, um, hard to listen to for a while before that fluency kicks in and automaticity. Um, but we need to let them work through tricky things to grow. So um, I, had, I had things from them like in their book bags before they got little books, just little short vowel booklets with just the words mm -hmm. and teaching them to track and keep their finger on the page and their eyes on the text. Um, their book bags would have had um, these as we went along and worked with our short vowels. And um, another thing that we did was um, a poetry duetang. So we had a poetry duetang in our desk and a poetry duetang at home. So anything that we um, had looked at in the week would go home as well so that they could practice more at home. That repeated reading has high efficacy. Mm -hmm. um, at the beginning of the year, it's really simple. Like again, it was that co those color words. And then we started to analyze what was happening in those words. Um, and, um, and the kids, this is another key part of the program they coded, they marked the poems and they marked words um, with the keys. So they would, they would code the uh, noisy E's and they would code the or, or, or sound mm -hmm. with an orange crayon. They would um, mark O, W with yellow, with an O crayon and so on. So the real basis of the program was having them um, learn um, short and long vowels and the macron and the brev going to um, mark those, the E eh or the E, and then the ow sound would have a band-aid over it, ow, 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 um, like in brown, um, or oh, 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 like yellow. So that's, that's what we, we did as well. Um, and I actually brought that even to intermediate when I had grade six, and we, we, I did use words their way, um, spelling inventory, and I did use their lists, but what we did was break those words down and analyze the sounds and we would code them um, and mark them up. Digraphs um, are boxed up and the kids yell box it up. <laughs> um, so it's just another way to see that pattern. The brain loves patterns and once they see them, they can't unsee them. So it was boxed up and was boxed up and shh. And before you know it, they, they've got it. Definitely. Well, and that's really important to highlight is, as you were saying, there are 44 sounds in the English language, but we only have 26 alphabetic letters. So there are those digraphs and trigraphs, and it's really important to teach kids that they are digraphs or trigraphs and highlighting that TH isn't t because there's no way that you can go from t they wouldn't discover that on, the, on their own, would they? No, Never. no. Um, before we move on, someone's wondering if those poems and the color program are available for purchase anywhere or access. No, I inherited these from Karen. This is literally their, 
there are things it's maybe a goal one day to um, make it accessible. Cause whenever I talk about it, people are really curious. So I love the colors because personally I love using colors and having like a, a crayon box the side, because I think it helps cement. And it, that's not a comment based on say, any research that I have noticed. I just know from personal experience and knowing how much fun the kids have doing it themselves. The other thing I wanted to mention was that when you're showing those short A books, I love how the arrow goes from left to right. So it's giving them a guide and something for them to put their finger on from the start and slide it across. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was important. Um, around Halloween, they can wear a witch finger to do that. You can get those googly eye um, rings um, from Amazon now. Um, so like anything that will engage them and hype it up a little bit, use those tools as well. Um, it adds excitement, but what are we doing? The same thing every day. We're looking and finding those key sounds to reading. So they're unlocking the code with the key sounds. And if it takes a little witch finger to keep their finger tracking, so be it. Um, but, um, and that was the piece when you, when we're doing the or, or sound, we're eating oranges um, for yellow, we would wear yellow glow bracelets and run around the gym a bit in the dark. Um, for the ing sound, um, this was this was the king of ing. Mm -hmm. um, he would go up on the wall, but some years it was the ring key. You could find those big big plastic rings at the dollar store, and now we we find ing in all of the words while we're wearing our big ring. Mm -hmm. um, just to, so anything to engage them as well and make it fun. Yeah. Making learning fun is a huge impact for the students instead of that, you know, drill sergeant way. And again, that's not something that we're trying to recommend or advocate for in structured literacy and um, the science of reading. It's all about getting kids engaged, having fun, learning the basics. Exactly. Um, for the, for the er, um, our controlled vowel, um, we find that in purple, mm -hmm. but um, I have a purple rooster on my wall now. Mm -hmm. And a friend, I, I didn't look, a friend um, that I work next door taught me this. She came up with it when, one day. She does a rooster tail above um, the U-R-I-R-E-R -E -R, and the kids mm -hmm. say, er, 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 er. Oh, and that's so, a good one. It's fun. And when I go through the halls of my new school, I can hear <laughs> sometimes when I go past classrooms that I've taught in, I can hear little voices. There she is. Er, 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 and they call out <laughs> at me as I walk by and um, they won't forget it. Like we crow like roosters. I'm crowing like a rooster. We're using a purple marker to do it. Yeah. And um, it's super engaging and fun. And they will, they'll have it always now. Yeah. <laughs> and, and those little tricks and tidbits really stay with you. I remember like the word build and built. Uh, I remember uh, the, the tutor that I was working with at the time, she brought in Lego and she said, you and I are going to build a house. And so we built a house at a Lego and then it's you and I built a house. So remembering that order of the you and I. And yes, I know you can't do this with every single word that isn't completely decodable, but I can still remember that numerous years later. Yeah, you'll never forget. It was fun, engaging, and it was memorable. And um, it was a nice moment too between you, right? Yeah. So at what point or did you ever start going into this a little bit more online? During the pandemic, yeah. During the pandemic, I felt awesome. solid in my program. Mm -hmm. Things started trickling out there. Um, there's more information about syllable types, for example. Um, mm -hmm. I had kiddos going to learning assistants, and um, my friend who was teaching learning assistants, and I started looking into syllable types. And did you know about open and closed syllables? No, I did not. Um, that they make up 75% of words, is it 50% are closed syllables? And as soon as these two of the students going to um, Tara for learning assistance and learn about open and closed syllables, after about a week, they got booted out 
learning assistants because all of a sudden they had another piece of information to unlock the code and they got it. So now they were my experts coming back to my grade one, two room, telling us about open and closed syllables because they did that with Ms. Jane's. And, um, and, and it just opened up a whole wide world um, yeah. for them. Um, so yeah, I think the information started trickling. I think with the pandemic and, and conferences online, started to just watch everything and listening to every podcast I could. Mm -hmm. um, but then that was the information that, that people were sharing. Like even this, like, I didn't really have that information in my head that if it's a C or a K, but like, it's very simple. The kids pick up on that really quickly um, when I show them that, mm -hmm. but I, I didn't have um, like those pieces in my brain. Yeah. I mean, it was there for discovery. I hadn't discovered it. <laughs> it had to be explicitly taught to me. Yeah. And uh, it's, there's also um, like the hard C, sorry, the hard G and the soft G, gentle giant in the gym. Right. Uh, and those tricks and things that you're not going to accidentally stumble over very easily. And it would be much more effective if you could just go to one place to get that. And, you know, there are a couple great places to look for that. There is uncovering the logic of English. Yeah. And according to uh, Kindle, I think it's like a four and a half hour read. Okay. Uh, and that goes a deep dive into understanding why English words are spelt the way they are and the rules and the numbers. And it's really useful. And once you read that, I mean, it's very easy to have it as a test reference to refer to because things are set out so explicitly. There is also Lynn Stone's Spelling for Life that, again, does that deep dive into why words are spelt the way they are. And it's important that we link the, the spelling instruction and the reading instruction together. Oh, exactly. Two sides of the same coin. Um, I have the books you're speaking of. I've read Uncovering the Logic of English, but I have stacks of books that I partially read or mean to read. What I found was listening to Denise Ides speak, like I've watched her several, several different webinars um, of Uncovering the Logic of English. Yeah. Um, seeing her visual cues for me and hearing her speak, that, that really helped. Um, when conferences were canceled and were happening online, when everyone could, could um, sign up and, and listen to her speak. I heard Louisa Moat speak live. It was amazing. I couldn't believe it um, during that time. But I also learned so much. Kendor Learning had um, some amazing um, webinars by Reading League, their conferences and symposiums. Um, um, Oregon, what was that out of Oregon? There was one recently. Um, anyway, it's just been an explosion of information. Yeah, Jan Hasbrook. Uh, with Oregon. Yeah. Think of the exact name. Yeah, that was one of the latest. Um, I sign up for them all. I watch many. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, I'm covering the logic of English. Another one, when I started talking to my kiddos uh, more in depth of, um, you know, these patterns, mm -hmm. um, the many jobs of silent E, that was mm -hmm. another one I didn't know. I thought, you know, it's magic E, but why was the E on give not? It's it's not saying gyve, it's mm -hmm. saying give. I didn't know about the V not ending in, in English, and no English words ending in V. So this was another yeah. book that I got. And during free choice center time, I had a gang of boys that would ask, could we please read your book? <laughs> it was so cute, but it was amazing. And um, they were taken with it because I think I was so taken with it and, and excited. Um, but that was another one that like I keep handy and, um, is a wonderful reference and it's actually pretty inexpensive on Amazon. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a good one to have. Well, and that's the thing. Like, I love how excited young children get when they're trying to break the code and like, oh, okay. Yeah. I can read that word because I know how to do it. I can break it into syllables. I can send out the syllables and then I can put it together. And that's where it's important to highlight that when we're using these instructional strategies, we're not just talk targeting 
the students who are lower achieving or at risk for reading failure. It's helping those students that are higher achieving and it allows us to take them that one step further because as you gain this knowledge as a teacher, you're able to uh, pepper in that incidental teaching. Exactly, in the moment, um, just that instant feedback and mm -hmm. corrective feedback in the moment. Whereas before, oh no, that doesn't go there. It's not like that, but not the why or a visual on my wall with an mm -hmm. explicit lesson. If, mm -hmm. there, if the error occurs and I can correct, correct it in the moment and remind, do you remember we talked about that and we had that lesson, it um, is way more impactful mm -hmm. um, than say listening to a child read in a running record and mm -hmm. trying to figure out what pieces they're missing and scratching mm -hmm. information all along the sides of a running record. And, and then try and remember, oh yeah, they're missing magic E and they're missing the digraph. Um, anyway, that's a whole other um, discussion. <laughs> yeah, of course. And it, you know, it is important to highlight the uh, information that we can get from screening our students and how that can inform our practices. Uh, and take our teaching again to that next level because we're able to target the students in the areas that they're weak in and have those, you know, smaller groups really make that big impact with the kids. Mm -hmm. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the transition that you've had in this past year to being a literacy coordinator and what you've learned and where you think you're going to go next with that. Um, well, my, my transition first started, I guess it was just over a year ago. I have some close friends that are in admin, um, at the high schools and, um, our middle school. They knew there was a, um, a gap with some of their students. They had some staff that didn't know how to teach kids to read. They teach at a middle school, um, and high school. Would I come and talk about emergent reading? and some of the things that we've talked about today. So as terrifying as it was, it was really important that I, that I share um, what was passed to me. Um, so I did a few, few of those presentations and then you know was watching these webinars. And it's one thing to have that knowledge and use it with your door closed in your little classroom with your kiddos, but to be able to articulate it and, and have it consolidated in your brain well enough to coach and teach um, was another thing. So I last summer, I really did a deep dive because I figured there may be more of these presentations mm -hmm. and the color keys and the sound keys. I thought I really should put together something. Carrie and Darlene used to present on that. I helped once, but um, I, I really felt compelled to share because I was so blessed. Mm -hmm. um, at the end of last summer, there was a job posting for a literacy coordinator. I had my room set up. I was teaching grade one, two. I'd been in there at the end of August, setting up my room, getting things ready and spent my long weekend writing my resume, which I never thought I would ever do again um, with the help of a friend. And um, about a week and a half later, I was in a new school, in a new position. <laughs> I didn't know what had hit me. Packing up your classroom. <laughs> yeah, someone, someone new walked in. I taught for a week and a half and um, someone, someone new stepped in. They gave us a day together in the room so I could show her my systems and routines, which she was happy to um, adopt because she was a brand new teacher, pretty new teacher. And um, I, I went and worked at a new school with um, like, a, it was targeted. There was a reason I was there, um, a, a large population, a transient population. We have immigrants, we have refugees, we have a high indigenous population. And, um, and then the data showed that there was some needs there. So um, in I stepped um, last September. The job was a one-year temporary role, and um, it was posted again. And I and I will be doing that role again in it for the next school year. Wonderful. So, what have you done in this past year that you think's made a difference? Like, do you think that the trajectory the students are on this year in that school is different from the one that they were on last year? I do. I do. Um, where, yeah, I do. Um, there, you know, there was some basics um, 
for a teacher teaching intermediate that they weren't taught and they wouldn't know in their class, they, they really, really had a, a wide range. One of our rooms had two proficient readers and the rest at risk with not much in between. Mm -hmm. um, so where do you start? Um, we, I started with um, the fact that we need phonemic awareness, whether you're six or 16, if you don't mm -hmm. have that strong foundation, you're gonna really struggle and you, and you won't just get that on your own. So I brought in um, district, um, our district supported us with sound walls. Mm -hmm. um, there's actually two coordinators. So when I say us now, I'm talking about my friend, Amy and I, um, she was at another school that had been targeted as well. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, I started with sound walls and training on phoneme graphene mapping, mm -hmm. because whether you're using the word mm, at or the word fantastic, you can, break up those big words or small words and you and you must um I talked about one sound could be more than one letter like just it was really the basics for our first for um PLC and um after school at lunch and going in and modeling some lessons that's amazing now I'm curious do you know if there's been changes in behavior from this year to previous years in the students um, that, that's, um, I don't know if we're there yet. Yeah. Um, it, it's a real mix. Like it, it, you know, as any class went, some years you have a really, um, an easier class. So some, mm -hmm. sometimes I went in where we're just that, like they'd all turn in unison and they were ready for the learning and eager and, and that room could have been in any school anywhere. Mm -hmm. And, um, others somehow, how did, how did we get this mix of, um, of kiddos that just had such diverse needs. On paper, everything looks the same and in reality. Um, so we had some, some rooms, you know, with behavior and um, some rooms that were just that easy flow that you get every seventh year or so. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, did behavior happen or change? I'm, I can't say yet. Yeah. Sometimes I, I found that once student realize they're getting what they need to learn how to read, they're more engaged in it. I would run around with my bin and either I would go in and I would teach whole, whole class and then I'd go to the next class and I would help run a literacy center. And then I would um, pull, pull a small group. So mm -hmm. it, maybe the teachers would be the ones to ask because I was just kind of whack-a-mole mm -hmm. throughout the school in different ways, um, which kept it really interesting. But, um, the other thing is that during COVID, um, a high percentage of our students stayed home. Mm -hmm. So there was two outreach teachers at our school that um, still worked with kids that weren't ready to come back. Mm -hmm. So um, every day there was a lot of absence, mm -hmm. a lot of absence. So unfortunately, yeah, a lot of our at, most at risk were the ones that weren't in the classrooms yet. Mm -hmm. Now, if you had some advice for a teacher that's just embarking on this journey, like where to go, what to start with and how to make the changes they need to make in their classroom and in their teaching, what would it be? I found at the beginning of this journey, like I, I did have that basic knowledge, mm -hmm. felt really lucky, but I found watching webinars and specifically, I think the first one I watched that just wowed me was the free, really great reading webinars. Mm -hmm. um, they have a summer series right now, in fact. Um, it did make me buy some of their products because they thought they looked so amazing, but um, you don't have to buy anything, they're free and just spoke to me. And I found what I actually did was I signed up again and again, because I knew that I would be coaching and running workshops and I needed mm -hmm. to be able to articulate this information in a clear way. Mm -hmm. So I think number one, really great reading webinars. And number two, um, listening to podcasts helped a lot. Actually, what got the fire in my belly going to was the Emily Hanford podcasts um, and shared, shared, shared that. I don't know that would give someone foundational information, but it would help them realize why there needs to be a change mm -hmm. and what some of the flaws were. Definitely. And 
that's the reason why so many podcasts are out there because it makes it accessible. It can be very difficult to find the time to sit down in front of your computer and watch a webinar for an hour. But then, you know, when you're driving, you're commuting, you're folding laundry, it's easier to turn on a podcast. And that's actually how this podcast came to be because we were, ha- I was having great conversations with so many educators uh, about the right to read and their journeys to scientifically based reading instruction. And I realized, you know what, there are so many webinars that I've signed up for over the years, and I just couldn't find the time to sit in my computer and watch it. So I'm like, you know what, the best way to make this more accessible is to create a podcast. So if you haven't already, please check out the Right to Read Initiative podcast, uh, like and subscribe. Yeah, it's amazing. You're doing wonderful work. Thank you. Yeah, you're very inspiring. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for joining me today, Lisa. I've really enjoyed our conversation and I can't wait till tomorrow to hear about those favorites that you have. Um, You've shared some amazing resources today and tomorrow I'm sure we're just going to get that deeper look, um, that aquarium view of your favorite strategies and resources that we might be able to use in our own classrooms uh, and with our own teaching. Yeah, I can't wait. Thanks for having me, Catherine. You're welcome.